Okay, Rob, Rob Hurst is uh, going to present uh, a couple of brief case studies. Yeah, three brief case, well, All right. two brief case histories, one that's a little longer. Wrap it up. And uh, hopefully I uh, won't keep you too long, and thank you for staying. So, that's Okay, so the case histories, the first one will be from Alumbrera in Argentina, and it'll deal with radiometrics, magnetics, and resistivity. Second one is the Santa Cecilia uh, deposit in Chile, and that's magnetic CSAMT, 3D DCIP, and 3D magnetotelerics. And the final case is a very recent one from Yaracucha. Uh, the data, or the press release that we'll be talking about, uh, is actually from October 1st, so it's rather timely, and it's based on recent uh, events. So the first one, Alum, Alumbrera in Argentina, uh, the picture here is looking south. The black arrow is the Colorado Norte, which is a high-grade uh, zone. Uh, the white arrow is uh, the Los Amarillos, which is uh, an area which is got strong sericitic alteration and abundant pyrite, and the brackets essentially are indicating uh, a low-grade core zone. Uh, the, the deposit is centered on a bunch of closely spaced uh, porphyritic stocks, which is in this area here, and there's dikes that are cross-cutting all the way through. There's seven phases of intrusion that have been identified, and most of the porphyries are similar to one another. Uh, with phenocrysoplagioclase, hornblende, biotite, quartz, and a matrix of fine grain quartz, K spar, minor plagioclase, biotite, etc., 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 and magnetite. Uh, the individual porphyries are distinguished mainly on the basis of uh, their intrusive contact relationships. Now, there's been a fair bit of work that's been done here, and so this one slide pretty much summarizes it. Um, there's a topographic expression of this deposit. It is surrounded by some very high hills. Uh, the magnetics, the central core is extremely magnetic. And then we have an area of magnetite destruction all the way around, which gives us this nice big halo effect. With the resistivity, because there's a sericitic cap here, uh, the re we have a resistivity low in the areas where it's most well developed. And then with the radiometrics, because there's been a lot of uh, potassium uh, concentration and destruction in, uh, in areas of potassic alteration, there's a very strong uh, potassium anomaly that's associated with it. Uh, it's very simple. Most of this uh, is quite well detailed by Hotchkey. Some of you may have taken in his talk a few years ago. And there's an excellent uh, presentation uh, that the ASCG has made available on YouTube. So if you want to explore this deposit further, I recommend that. Uh, Santa Cecilia is in Chile. Uh, this deposit is rather interesting because it almost fits every phase of Silito's model and cartoon almost perfectly. Uh, there's intense hydrothermal alteration which has affected all the rocks at uh, Santa Cecilia. Uh, comprises a peripheral por propolytic zone and an inner shell of quartz alanite, sericite, chlorite, and clay pyrite. Intensity is indicative of mineralization, which includes stockwork intrusives, uh, porphyry type intrusives, and silicified structures. And the alteration is three kilometers wide and centered on Cerro del Medio, which is this peak here. And it extends down along the ridge uh, to where it narrows to approximately one kilometer. In this particular area of survey, there's a thousand meters of elevation that had to be dealt with. And this diagram here just shows the relationship between Silito's model and the various phases which had been mapped out by the geologists at uh, Santa Cecilia. And based on these relationships, one can come up with what would be the expected uh, DC resistivity and IP response. So on the host rock, we're expecting high resistivity, no chargeability, moderate mag susceptibility. The stock, again, moderate resistivity, low chargeability, and 
moderate susceptibility again. And then the alteration zones would vary from low to moderate uh, resistivity, moderate to high chargeability, and a low susceptibility. <coughs> There's been a fair bit of work, and the initial work consisted of doing a ground magnetic survey, uh, which helped to find five separate little zones. Uh, there was a mobile metal ion uh, geochemical sampling program, and this identified uh, some very prominent gold and copper anomalies. There was a, sh a small CSAMT survey which was conducted over the bulk of the main body of the stock, and uh, this was followed up by a limited diamond drilling program. Uh, only two holes, both were discovery holes and that led to a much larger survey afterwards. So the initial results from the mag, from the reduction to the pole, you can start to see the area of magnetite destruction associated with the alteration. Uh, when we go to the 2VD, the boundary is, stands out much more, but we're also starting to pick up uh, some of the additional mineralization in and around the stock. So we're starting to see some of the circular halo effect that's predicted by Silito's uh, model. Uh, the CSAMT was four lines, two long ones, two short ones, over the central part of the stock. These are the 2D inverted sections, and there was a large conductive feature sitting right in the middle. When it was gridded and viewed in 3D, it formed this horseshoe shape. And uh, this horseshoe shape is kind of important because whenever we look at the mobile metal ion anomalies, uh, both the gold and the copper, uh, the highest values are centered over top of the, uh, the CSAMT anomaly, but they also are a similar horseshoe shape. And then if we look at the, the CSAMT both in profile and we take a depth slice out, we can see that there's some ex potential extent to the, to the uh, conductivity anomaly. And what's also shown are the two discovery holes. Uh, the holes contain mineralization far in excess of what the CSAMT was showing, so this suggested that the CSAMT wasn't looking deep enough and that there was much more to this deposit. This was followed up with a uh, Orion 3D survey, which consisted of 539 current injections, over 300 receiver dipoles, all of them live at all times during the survey, um, and also a hundred discrete MT sites. So this resulted in a cloud of uh, parent resistivity points, uh, well over 150,000 data points, and the same thing with the chargeability. Even in the apparent resistivity, we can start to see some of the, the circular features, which again are consistent with Silito's model. Uh, inverting the data set in 3D and clipping it to the sensitivity, to the area of highest sensitivity. Again, in the resistivity, we're starting to see some of the circular features and the zonation that we expect based on Silito's model, and we also see the same thing happening in the chargeability. We take a, a slice out of there, a pie slice out. We have our uh, conductivity anomaly, which matches where the CSAMT was coming in. And we also have a nice chargeability feature with it as well. And again, you can start to see some of the ring structures have a bit more depth to it, some, some don't, but we're getting into the zonation, again, that Silito's model predicts. And we can slice this at, at depth. And again, in the main central stock, we're starting again to see more of the circular pattern development depending on the depth. We move into... Uh, the MT survey, invert that, we have this large MT cube. Uh, we can take some slices out of it all the way through. In the central portion again, where the uh, CSAMT anomaly is, we have a very well-developed MT anomaly. Then as we take yet another look, in this case we're bringing in the DC resistivity. It actually matched quite well. The DC resistivity was mapping out the top of the central conductive stock. Uh, the MT was mapping out uh, quite a nice feature 
And additionally, it was starting to show the roots of the system. So by bringing the MT in, we're starting to actually be able to uh, characterize the entire system and have a better feel for where we actually are in the system, again, based on Solito's uh, model. And if we compare uh, the MT with the uh, CSAMT, which is in the left panel there, uh, again, we can see the CSAMT matches fairly well, but the uh, MT definitely shows that it's a much larger conductive body. If we superimpose the drill holes, which is in the right section, and we're only looking at a 10 ohm meter uh, conductivity shell there, the majority of the drill hole and the high gold and copper values uh, fall within that 10 ohm meter range. And if we were to expand this out to 15 ohm meters, it would cover the uh, the drilling off completely. Uh, the final example is uh, from Yaracocha in Peru. Uh, the Yaracocha mine is located in the uh, Alice district of, uh, I know I'm pronouncing this all wrong, Yayos province, Department of Lima. Geographically it is uh, the high zone of the eastern Andean Cordillera. Um, it's a uh, it's an area where the Nazca plate slips beneath the overriding South American continental plate. Most of the stratigraphy structure, magnetism, um, volcanism, mineralization are spatially and genetically related to the uh, tectonic evolution. Uh, Yuracocha features multiple polymetallic deposits represented by scar and carbonate placement bodies, intrusion hosted, uh, etc. etc. Uh, in general, there's a huge uh, monzonite on one side and then we have a marble limestone on the other side and the main ore zones are falling in the structural zone between the two. Uh, there's several deposits. This is an active mine both with underground workings and surface workings. Uh, it's in challenging terrain again. The no, most recent area is often. Was it rough or was this a porphyry? No, this is a porphyry. Um, I think it's carbonate replacement. Yeah. Um, there is, there is, um, it's a fairly echogranular granodiorite in there, but there are, there are some porphyry dikes in there. Yeah. And, uh, so a, a large scale Titan survey was conducted over. Um, several years, uh, both DCIP and MT covering the entire trend. Uh, we're only going to look at one line from the most recent survey, but again, because this was an active mine, there, it's a very high noise environment uh, due to the infrastructure and the operations, so it's a bit challenging on the noise side as well as topographically. There is a, uh, a tunnel. The, Klepetko tunnel, which uh, links up a number of the deposits. When they were going through the tunnel, uh, they actually came across a high grade, uh, well, relatively low grade zone, which is the yellow in here. Uh, they had their known zone off in, in this side, which was mostly structurally controlled, but a combined uh, joint inversion of the DC resistivity with the MT uh, produced this anomaly here, which, okay, their deposit is definitely on the structure. We can map out the fault. Uh, they decided they wanted to test to see what was going on in this portion here. Uh, so they drilled from underground from the tunnel. They drilled down into the porf uh, into uh, this porphyry that was in, in this uh, monzonite that happened to be in there. So this was a new discovery for them. It was something that they did not expect to see. And uh, the grades were are pretty good. Uh, there's high grade portions, uh, lower grade, and this is their interpretation of what they think the, uh, the, the potential extent of this low grade zone is. And these are just some samples of what the core looks like and the grades that they encountered on this one kilometer hole that they drilled from underground. So, in conclusion, uh, 
as I'm sure you've discussed most of the most of this session, uh, porphyries uh, tend to be highly magnetic, magnetite rich. We can map out the cores, the mineralization, and the zonation. If there's a resistive cap, that can be mapped out, um, and the high chargeability that goes with it. Radiometrics can be of use. Uh, CSAMT, DCIP, putting all this into 3D space, looking at it all combined in one view, it allows us to see where we potentially are in the overall system and how it relates to everything else. And it uh, can be a very good guide to future exploration efforts, even around existing mines. And if we can integrate geochemistry and geologic mapping, we can come up with an even stronger uh, interpretation. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Dave Thompson of Cerro Grande Mining, uh, Sierra Metals, and there's a list of references here, of the main references where you can go to for more information and data on any of these deposits. Um, on that short sweep, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, well, we didn't get the lights turned off. We could have done it, but anyways, <laughs> we, we were told it was going to shut down at five, so we were sort of waiting, <laughs> waiting for Doctor Doom. So, uh, anyways, thanks very much to our speakers and to the audience. Um, I know some of you will enjoy the natural fields session tomorrow, but uh, we'll get a note out on Segmin. Uh, and if anybody doesn't know how to get on Segmin, as I say, try and reach out to me. Uh, you can just I. Fortunately, Google up very easily. So, but uh, there you go. Thank you very much.